Someone took an 8mm film of this infamous paramilitary camp. On it, investigators for the House Committee on Assassination saw David Ferry, Lee Harvey Oswald, Guy Bannister, and CIA Mexico City Station Chief David Atlee Phillips immortalized on an 8mm home movie shot in the summer of 1963. Barry Seal, who took 8mm movie footage, which we've used extensively in this program, might have taken that film. But then something happened. After the exciting discovery of this film, and while in the custody of the House of Representatives of the United States of America, it was stolen and never recovered. Who has the power to pull a black bag job in our nation's capital on one of the three co-equal branches of the U.S. government? Probably not the Ghostbusters. Here are a couple other places associated with the Kennedy assassination that should also be listed in the National Historical Registry. This famous building symbolizes the CIA mob merger so well that it should have been declared a National Historic Site. Instead, it was torn down and today is a federal office building. Housed here were Guy Bannister's offices, which served as the war room for the anti-Castro Cuban Revolutionary Council. They all worked here, Guy Bannister, Dave Ferry, Lee Oswald, Barry Seal. This is also where Barry met mobster Murray Kessler, with whom he will be arrested in 1972. James Miller is the pilot who was arrested with Barry in that 72 bus. Well, I was aware that Barry had known Murray Kessler uh, since the 60s, at some time, early 60s, and that Murray was one of the ones that we were uh, discussing the overthrow of Cuba with. And this is Redbird Airfield, just outside Dallas, Texas, where a getaway plane took off unmolested after the assassination. Several hours after the assassination of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy, in the afternoon of November 22, 1963, an FAA flight controller here at Redbird Airfield saw suspicious activity, which he attempted to report to the FAA. The air traffic controller on duty became suspicious after observing three men in business suits board an aircraft an hour after the killing. When the plane took off on runway 17, he asked the pilot if he needed any assistance and then asked which way the plane was heading. The pilot stated south. The controller then watched as the plane flew south for two miles, made a hard left, and flew north towards Love Field. The pilot had lied. Those in the tower had received a special bulletin telling them to report suspicious activity to a special security number. And we kept calling that number all afternoon, getting nothing but a busy signal, the controller told us until we heard that they had caught the lone gunman, as they called it. Then we stopped calling and let the matter drop. Four years later, an assistant district attorney from Jim Garrison's office came calling to show pictures of possible pilots involved in the incident that day. One of them, a weird-looking character with a funny-looking wig, was on the evening news just a week later. They said his name was David Ferry and that he had committed suicide, the controller told us. That's when I smelled a rat. Barry Seals, CIA recruiter David Ferry, was under suspicion for participation in the plot to kill Kennedy less than 24 hours after the assassination. Had Garrison known then what we know today, he might never have turned his suspect over to the FBI to be released with an apology. Just how much can CIA agents get away with? Would you believe child molestation? In 1961, David Ferry was arrested on numerous charges of pedophilia. Meet the New Orleans cops who busted Ferry for molesting young boys. Well, from the statements we got, we arrested, I think, if I can remember correct, was uh, harboring runaways, uh, contributing to the delinquency of juveniles, and I think uh, there was a crime against nature. Well, I, we were investigating a Civil Air Patrol outfit whose parents were complaining to us that their boys were from time to time on runaway status, were missing, and had been missing for some time. We discovered that he was having sexual relations with the boys, contributing to their delinquency, doing things like if he moved into a new apartment, all the boys would sit around in a circle and masturbate, celebrating the new event. We, we arrested him. We, we executed a search warrant as properly as the law calls for. 
Normally, anyone arrested for molesting children wants to slip into a hole somewhere and pull it in after him. Instead, David Ferry had warrants issued for the police officers who arrested him. We discovered that arrest warrants were put out for us. Arrest warrants for myself and other men who had been on the raid at his home. And that was a big, big shock to me, uh, to find that, that he had secured arrest warrants for our arrest. It was a, a frightening moment for me because I couldn't imagine having done anything wrong. And to have a search warrant out for me, I mean an arrest warrant out for me, was t somewhat terrifying. But it went on for a number of days, the, the, the fright and the fear and the intimidation uh, that I felt. Couldn't believe it. It's never happened before anything like that, you know. I figured he had to know somebody, and that's the only thing I could figure. He had low power. That here was a man with incredible power. He had some power somewhere uh, to do this to us. And we were, as I said, was 40 years ago, we were young, naive young men. We didn't quite understand what was happening to us. But uh, the thought occurred to me that he had a CIA connection. It, it did occur to me, and I had really no idea where it was coming from, but I knew it was uh, some incredible force behind him helping him. What happened next was even more bizarre. As the time went on, I started getting phone calls from Cubans who claimed that they were head of the Cuban Revolutionary Front here in New Orleans. And on one occasion, I was uh, told that they could deliver runaway boys for me, this was from the Cubans, if we had, if we would promise not to prosecute Captain Ferry. In America, when you work for the CIA, being connected means never having to say you're sorry, as we will now see in the budding career of the young Barry Seal. This man, Joe Nettles, was a kind of second father to the young Barry. I met Barry Seal when I was out there taking flying lessons with Ed Dufford. And Ed Barry was out there all the time. And Barry, uh, he was a senior in high school. I said, Barry, what you gonna do when you get out of high school? I said, I'm gonna work for you. I said, you ain't working for me. You going to college. He told me, he said, Joe, I'm fixing to make $200,000. So what you gonna do, rob a bank? He said, no, I'm gonna fly some arms to Cuba. I said, you're going to fly to the penitentiary. Where are you going to fly to? Barry's arrest with a plane load of weapons, we learned, had taken place in the tiny town of Longview, Texas. Joe wishes more than he can say that Barry hadn't been so lucky with the judge. Oh, he showed me a letter from the, from the judge. I believe it was a very complimentary letter. It, it exonerated him from any guilt whatsoever. He got out of that. If he hadn't gotten out of that, he never would have gotten into the other deeper stuff he got into because he thought if he could get out of that, he could get out of anything. He thought he was invisible. Pointed a finger at me and said, this man taught me everything I know. I said, no, I didn't. I didn't teach you to keep take arms to Cuba. He just laughed. He laughed at everything. Invincible is, of course, just another way of saying above the law. This arrest is just the first of at least four separate arrests during Barry Seal's spook career, which we uncovered that have never before been reported. Charlie Montgomery was recruited by Barry in the same way he himself had been recruited by David Ferry. I met Barry in the summer of 68. I was 11 years old. And it was one of those things where I was uh, the monotonous kid that he couldn't get rid of. So he had to take me in. I was free to roam the neighborhood and he had a helicopter parked in the front of his house on a trailer so there was an obvious attraction to an 11 year old kid who wanted to be around aircraft. I was pretty free to go and come as I pleased and the older I got the more freedom I got where I could disappear for long periods of time and nobody really wondered why. Like David Ferry before him, Barry Seal's career clearly illustrates the merger of the CIA and the mob. Uh, it was a, a late evening one night probably 10 11 o'clock we were at the aircraft company and uh, this is one of the very few times I've seen Barry nervous very rarely was he nervous and he asked me to go to work for an organization 
that had been around me and I'd worked around a lot of the people and they felt like they liked my work and I would be good for them. But it was a very big commitment. It was much later after the things started coming out, I had all kinds of suspicions. And then after the 72 arrest, I was real confused because I thought it was more organized crime type thing and as it went on it, it had more of the pictures of some sort of other involvement, maybe secret activity or government or somewhere along those lines. It was very clear that there was no turning back once you cross that boundary. It was a permanent decision. We were interested in importing shrimp into the New York area from Panama, which could have been and would have been very lucrative. We met first uh, with Carlo Gambino. Uh, we explained, Barry did most of the explanation, uh, what we wanted to do. Mr. Gambino seemed to think it might be a good idea, but his nephew Manny was in charge of all the restaurants and various places like that. However, he was busy at the time, so we arranged to meet with him several days later. And several days later, Manny Gambino disappeared. They found blood in his car, and no one has seen Manny Gambino since that time, as far as I know. In a weapons smuggling bust in 1972, James Miller was arrested with Barry with seven tons of plastic explosive, part of an ongoing and never-before-revealed CIA plot to overthrow Castro in the 70s. Barry Seal was led by someone that obviously he had a lot of faith in to believe that Cuba was going to be overthrown with the backing of the United States government through the CIA. We were offered support from the uh, Mexican Air Force, uh, from people. We, we flew into an Air Force base in Mexico. We met with some people that had uniforms on, and I have no idea what their rank was supposed to have been. But we met with those people and assured by them that, that we would have their full support if we needed it and wanted it. And then we, of course, returned to the United States and with the understanding we'd have all the support from everybody, including the United States government, through the CIA. And that's not what transpired. Arkansas Governor Bill Clinton has long been suspected of having ties with Barry Seal. Guess what? The suspicions were correct. One of the uh, local DEA agents had told me that Barry had been arrested in Mena, Arkansas. And I ran into Barry a week or two later uh, at a pay telephone. And we were talking. And he said, let me show you something. So he showed me a paper that was, you know, somebody has to sign his bond for him to get out of jail. Signed by Bill Clinton, who at that time, I believe, was the attorney general for the state of Arkansas. 